Okay, so we're going to start now with the last speaker of the day. Uh, his name is Jose Ramon Agustina. He is a professor at the Universitat Internacional de Catalunya, International University of Catalonia. And he's also uh, a member of uh, the Molins and Silva Attorney's Office. Uh, we would like to thank him especially because he had a very fast uh, reaction. We gave him a very short notice on the presentation, so it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have him here today. And uh, I give him the floor for him to give the last presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, you hear well? Yeah. Um, so this is the kind of uh, digestive presentation of this afternoon. I hope you, you, you keep attentive, very attentive. And it's my pleasure. And thank you for the invitation for this presentation and for this opportunity of, uh, to speak uh, to people uh, working on the administration of justice in um, Denmark, um, Latvia, and um, Estonia, is that right? Okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, insights on governance and crime prevention within corporations. Sorry, I, I got the flu last week and I'm still under the effect of antibiotic and I'll, I promise I'll do my best, but my, my mood is kind of absent-minded right now. So I apologize for whatever it happens. Um, insights on governance and crime prevention within corporations. That's the, the title of the presentation. And the idea is to talk about a little bit of uh, corruption uh, within corporations from, uh, not, uh, not from a, a criminological point of view, not only a legal point of view, but criminological. Um, the beginning, I think, um, getting started, um, what's going on right now in Spain with um, corporate crime? Are corporations being charged so far in Spain? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we don't have experience yet, just a few cases of, of prosecutions. I think that the, uh, one of the representatives of the, of the pro prosecution uh, has talked this morning uh, to you, and uh, you already know about this. Um, from my experience, uh, I've been uh, assisting with internal investigations in uh, subsidiary um, companies um, conducted by lawyers from the United States in some cases. And that's the, the only experience um, until now in Spain in, in these um, issues, in these situations within corporations. And another uh, key factor, I think, from my point of view, is that in, in all this matter, in all this field, with all the, this um, uh, penal code reformation, um, I would say that... Um, kind people, but not ex expert people, auditors and people without in-depth knowledge in, in criminal law and corporate crime are writing right now uh, compliance programs. And that's, I think that's very dangerous from my point of view. Um, for writing a um, compliance program, you need to know about uh, criminal law and you need to know about criminology. You need to know about the, the concrete sector you are talking about. And it's, it's, it's key for that. I mean, um, we also are waiting for some certainty about how corporate crime is going to be prosecuted in Spain. We don't know. We don't have tangible criteria until now. We have um, a lot of theories, uh, interpretations about the law, but the law has not been uh, applied until now. And in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile what's, what's going on then? We have a shocking contrast. We are going to see some of them now. And we have the, the market getting very crazy. Um, well, um, my first experience in, in all this uh, stuff was when um, a couple of, of years ago, a um, 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 colleague of mine in, in the, at the firm where I'm working right now uh, asked me about uh, assisting a, a U.S. lawyers in a, a corporate affair investigation in, in a subsidiary in, in here in Spain. And the, I mean, I call this, this uh, case the, the envelope case. Um, it was very, um, very funny in a sense, and very, very strange for me. 
um, the matter is that an envelope containing 1,11,500 euro was discovered in, within the, the safe, one of the safes of the company by an employee, uh, just in, in a tray. And the thing is that the, the, the company, uh, all, the, all the people, the staff were very scared about that. And uh, just from then uh, started a, a, an internal process to how to do with that. And they reported to the, to the, um, to the um, um, how is it called, um, the headquarters in, in the United States. And they sent four lawyers from Chicago to Barcelona to see what's going on with that. I mean, uh, just think about it. Uh, one envelope with uh, not more than 5,000 uh, euros is not that much money. And only the, the flights, I mean, uh, when four lawyers coming to Spain, what's, what's going on? I mean, and the question <laughs> was a little bit funny. Uh, where is the problem? I mean, they found a, a, an envelope without justification. What's, what's going on? Where is the... But the problem was that the, there, there was a, a, an old um, uh, matter on, on um, rivalries and, and something strange in the company in the past. We didn't know by then. Well, the thing is that um, in, from that moment on, um, started, um, it started uh, the, the, the ordinary process of an internal investigation in that company, and, and I had to, to assist the lawyers in that, in that uh, thing. And it was very surprising to me, how was the reaction of the, the staff in the company? Spanish people, uh, not accustomed to these kind of situations, and uh, men in black, landing at the, the company one morning, people scared. Uh, some of them were um, uh, appointed for an, an interview, but they didn't know about what, what, was, what, what was going on. And they, were, um, they entered the one room, and we, are, we, we were, all of us, um, four lawyers for, from Chicago, me, myself, uh, one uh, interpreter, and asking questions about something that happened in this, with this envelope. And was, that was very, very curious. And as you know, I don't know if you, you know the, the Spanish uh, way of life or mood in when something is happening in, in a small context. But rumors are very common, and people are talking all the time about that. And in a Spanish company, it was very, uh, it was like a, like a bomb. And all the people were very... Uh, very um, like su suspecting from one another. And that was very important to me, at least to see that uh, when we are applying a, a corporate investigation system or a corporate compliance system from the United States to Spain, I mean, there are different um, features which are uh, not really, um, um, you, you cannot transport, you cannot apply the same categories uh, thought in the United States to another cultural context, like in Spain. I don't know, the, the, I mean, you can imagine now the differences, uh, cultural differences, the clash of cultures between uh, your countries and Spain or whatever. There are many differences. And in, in all these this stuff and all, managing all this process of uh, internal investigation is really important to think about how is the, the, the way of life, the way of thinking, the way of reacting when something is happening in, in an internal investigation. Market is crazy. You can see this. No? Lionel Hood's attorney, also expert shoe repair. Um, that's a joke, obviously, or not. I don't know. I really don't know. But the thing is that many times you can find people now um, selling uh, compliance programs without any kind of uh, prestige, without uh, expertise in, in the matter, which is very dangerous. And you can, you can see uh, somehow that um, the market is not differentiating the, the, the good stuff from the bad stuff. And you can, you can uh, buy a compliance program, but um, which is not tailored for your company, which is a, a, a very formal and, and a specific uh, form for any kind of entity, legal entity, 
uh, traveling in this, in this sea of the society. Um, is compliance an opportunity to reduce corruption? That's a, a good question. I, I, I try to um, link these three concepts, compliance, opportunity, and corruption, which seems to me that they are very linked in a, in a sense, and I'm, I'm going to try to show you why. Um, first idea, the time of compliance has come, or rather criminal compliance, that's, that's the key, criminal. Um, I think that compliance, criminal compliance programs um, could make a change, could make things change, uh, because business ethics approach maybe was not uh, enough to force, to implement changes in, in a context like, uh, at least in, in the Spanish context. I don't know. Uh, afterwards, I, I, I would like to, to talk about the, the um, I don't know, you have read this book of um, Max Weber about the, um, um, how is it called, the, um, the ethics of the, Protestant, the Protestants and the capitalism. And uh, he was talking about the idea that in the capitalism, uh, in the capitalist countries uh, where the Protestantism was present, uh, the culture is really different from, uh, uh, say, Catholic countries. I don't know why. Maybe I, I would like to ask a sociologist, why is that difference from uh, a Catholic to a Protestant point of view when we are talking about duties? Um, I don't know. Maybe uh, Protestants are mm, not uh, so much open to redemption like Catholics. I don't know. But the thing is that a Catholic, in a Catholic culture, it's more easy um, to tolerate uh, deviance because there is a, a, an opportunity for redemption. I don't know, that's a guess from my point of view. But that's very important in terms of if you are designing a, a compliance program and you are not providing this program, enforcing it with uh, criminal sanctions, why are you going to comply with the law? Um, because if there is only a code of ethics or a business ethics approach, uh, maybe it's, it's, too, um, it's not enough. Um, when, when we um, touch the corporate crime, we can see that a corporate crime, it's a sign that something, something really wrong and, and big is happening. You, can see, you have seen this uh, Volkswagen's uh, um, case now. And everyone is affected with uh, corporate crime. Everyone from the top to the, to the bottom of the company. When a corporation catches a cold, someone else sneezes. Uh, that's that's uh, really true. The second idea, true compliance versus makeup compliance, affecting F's incentive. Okay, um, why, why we need this, uh, to change this mind in, when understanding compliance programs and trying to make um, a change um, from this sterile makeup compliance model? Well, um, this is not only about the, um, the avoiding um, being sanctioned. I mean, when a company, uh, when a board of directors is, is thinking about um, trying to avoid a, a criminal sanction, of course, they are thinking about reputation, of course. But this is not only a matter of, of that, and maybe they are, they are gonna think from now on in terms of um, winning a bonus, a better deal, a full exception even, with the prosecution office, whatever. But this is not only a matter of avoiding bad things, trying to avoid, I mean, we are not talking about only of um, negative effects. We can talk about positive effects because you are putting order in your company. You are making things clear. Uh, you can, in a sense, you can say you are building a structure of virtue. I like, I like very much this, this uh, saying. What's a structure of virtue? A structure of virtue is a structure that leads the, the members who are living or um, functioning inside that structure 
in the right direction. Um, I don't know because this presentation has to be very short, but one of the, the ideas I want to show you was the, the um, situational crime prevention perspective. Have you ever heard about this approach, situational crime prevention perspective? Someone here in this room has ever heard about this expression? Marcus Felsen's theory, criminologists talking about the situational approach? Nobody, okay. So that's, I think that's very, very important, and we can go quickly. Well, well this is an example of the reputational costs here in, in Barcelona. As you know, the Barcelona soccer team have been uh, charged with criminal charges about this um, um, striker, uh, Neymar, no? about this um, tax crime. And it was probably, it was the first appearance in, 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 in the press about a, a corporation prosecution here in, in Barcelona. And it's a good notice, it's a good news for, for um, people working on compliance programs because I think this is the first step towards a, a reality of compliance programs being effective. At least one could happen in this sense. Um, okay, let's, let's go to this fourth point. Um, well, the, thir the third point towards a real multidisciplinary approach, I, I wanted to say that um, when we are um, approaching compliance programs, we think we need to think uh, from a very open mind and to combine very different disciplines in, in managing people and in, in constructing the structure and defining the, the limits, the boundaries where people are functioning. Um, you can talk about criminology, human resources, management, business ethics, criminal law, and policy. But among all these disciplines, it's very important some, some sort of dialogue between them to bridge the gap. Because me, myself, for instance, I'm a criminal lawyer. I studied also criminology, and I have two perspectives. And when I started studying criminology, my point of view from the criminal law was amazingly enhanced. Because you understand a reality, not from a normative point of view, but from an empirical point of view. Um, there is another book, for instance, very interesting, from a criminal lawyer, a, a professor, American professor um, by name Stuart Green, who wrote a book, uh, I think uh, seven, eight years ago, about um, the, the title is uh, uh, Cheating, Stealing. Um, I think it's right here. Lying, Cheating, and Stealing, A Moral Theory of White Collar Crime. This is Stuart Green, and he wrote this book uh, trying to make a point towards... Um, a moral theory of white collar crime. He's a criminal law scholar, and he was trying to make the point that when, when the legislator is talking about uh, criminal conducts, they are talking about the same, the same core concepts that we are thinking when we are talking about uh, morality. And it's true that jurisprudence, the, I mean, the, the judges are trying to construct concepts from a, a legal point of view. But the, the base for that is the same core concepts. Well, um, let's talk about a little bit right now about corruption as um, in terms of opportunity approach. Corruption is not only a form of crime. The definition of corruption uh, could be the abuse of power for personal gain. But... So must we use the law to draw the line? I mean, when we are talking about corruption, I think we can think on a, a very um, big, um, different colors and gray tones from crimes itself to uh, misdemeanors or deviances or disloyalties. Um, that's corruption. You are using your position within the company for personal gain. You are being egoistic for 
using the, the common good for your own benefit. That could be a criminal or not, but it doesn't matter somehow. You can start by doing uh, petty things, but if you don't have control, you're gonna go over and over, and you're gonna go uh, farther and beyond that. And that's the logic when we are without control. Where is the line? The situational crime approach, prevention approach, say, says this. I mean, this opportunity makes the thief. If you are working in an environment without control, you are gonna make wrong actions. Um, and that's very natural. And in a sense, if we are, um, um, we have uh, strong principles, but, and we are very loyal to that principles, but we are um, pressured by circumstances which incline us to commit differences, it's very easy. It's a slippery slope, uh, slippery slope very easy to um, fall down in, in, in situations very close to crime, very close to crime within a company. And it, the difference is not that, I mean, when, when you can talk about a Rodrigo Rato scandal case, I don't know if you are familiar with that, you can talk about um, cases where the like, uh, white collar criminality um, with a lot of money um, around, but you can talk about the, the, that employee, very humble employee, which the only thing that can do, because he's at hand, is taking some papers from the company, some uh, photocopies, um, like different perks or fiddles or whatever, things that um, probably in, in economic terms are not substantial, but in the moment that that person, humble person, with a um, few um, possibilities at hand, change his situation and access to um, a more valued, more valued um, things in the company, it's a, a very dangerous situation. I don't know if you know what I mean, but this situational crime prevention approach, the, the core concept of that is um, crime occurs when a likely offender, and everybody's a likely offender, and a suitable target come together in time and place without a capable guardian present. That's, that's very simple, because in a sense it's very simple. I mean, the coincidence of these three elements, a likely offender, a suitable target, and a time and place without guardian capable. That's a very simple um, uh, pro proposition. But if you think about it in, in tangible terms, when we are not controlled, we need trust in the company. Within the company, we need trust, but we need control. If we don't have the, the right control, if we are not asked about the money we are managing, if we are not asked about the time we are spending in that particular staff, we are gonna go um, stray in a, in a way. And that's the, the, the concept, that, that's the, the rationale in, in this analysis. Um, let's apply this science to, to decreasing the opportunities. And to, so let's, let's think about the, the place, the target and the offender. How can I protect the target? The target could be the, the, the cash, the money. It could be the, um, the absenteeism. It could be whatever. It could be the possibilities of briberies. It could be whatever you think. That's a target. The place in every single place has to be, um, it could be employee theft or it could be uh, corruption in any kind of sort. Um, you can think, you can apply this, this triangle of, of crime for any kind of situation within your company. Okay, um, so we have talked about corruption and opportunity and is compliance an opportunity to reduce, to reduce corruption? How can do it? How can improve our good governance approach in, in this uh, mission we are trying to, to conquer? So what's good governance and what's a good compliance? 
um, very briefly, I can say, or I would like to say, that good governance means the process of decision making and the process by which decisions are implemented or not, or not implemented. That's good governance. So, and the relation with good compliance is that all that process in decision making and decisions implemented has to be kept for evidence for the next step when something wrong, something strange has happened. Um, this is like the, the ship's log. In, in Spanish, we say the cuaderno de bitácora. The, the ship's log is that um, notebook, that paper, that register where we uh, keep evidence of whatever is going on important in the terms of what, what's going on. I mean, in, in a company, we should, the first question when we draft a compliance program is, what is, what's, what's the, 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 the map of risks? Mapping risks mean, means to think about the, the company in terms of its activities, its sector of activity. And in, within this, its sector of activity, you can think about the problems or the, the risks the employees or the directors can touch in the real interactions. Um, it's not the same, the construction sector or the commercial profession, the commercial position, or the board of directors, the employee who is selling goods to the public, whatever. No, we, we need to think in the, in the activities, the sector, and the positions. And we need to keep evidence of whatever is, is uh, needed in, in, in a when something wrong or something uh, uh, criminal is, has happened in, in the company. Okay, so if we are trying to keep evidence of everything, uh, what's going on if we are not in the right direction? Because a bad compliance program or a compliance program could be key for protecting the company. But if the, if the program is bad, you can... Uh, I mean, it could happen that you are cutting off the nose to spite the face. Because if you are um, keeping evidence of your, uh, your um, how, is, um, how is that, your clumsiness, you are, I mean, you are sentencing you in the future. Because when the investigators, when the uh, criminal prosecutor uh, will come to your company and say, please show me the, uh, your your notebooks, your, your evidence. That evidence will be definite for you. I mean, that's very dangerous. So let's see uh, what's, what's going on when, when you are um, um, doing or drafting your compliance program with no, with uh, the, this uh, kind of um, happy uh, mentality of, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm complying with a record right now. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but in the future, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face very difficult, serious problems if I'm not now very careful about what, what kind of process I'm building, I'm designing to protect my own responsibility, individual responsibility from the directors or people managing the situations you are dealing with or the, the company itself. Okay. Um, I don't know uh, the time. How is it going? Um, it's 3.25. Okay. Now, uh, I would like to... I mean, that was the, the introduction of the presentation, but I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm not going to um, finish my presentation. So, anyway, um, five ideas. The first one is corruption and crime within corporation within corporations, how to become an expert on anthropology of workplace crime. That's the first point. And I cannot resist to talk to you about um, this, um, um, well, first of all, um, from a criminological point of view, um, talking about corruption is talking about occupational crime, which is a crime committed through, from the position, and taking advantage of the position, abusing the power you have received and on your own benefit. That's the idea. 
that's the idea. Um, so how to be an expert on anthropology of work of time? I, I could not resist to talk about uh, Gerald Marr's book, Cheats at Work. It's a, an old uh, work. I think it, it, was, it, it was published in 1982, I think so, right now. And, and it's a very uh, good approach um, how to um, analyze the different kinds of positions in the company and the different kinds of criminal risks and how to um, understand how corruption works. Um, it's a kind of paradox. Gerald Marsh showed that creating cheating at work, sorry, cheating at work was often a result of how jobs were organized. He focused on the sorts of rewards employees get, and he distinguished three categories, formal rewards, both legal and illegal, informal rewards, legal like perks, tips, and illegal pilfering, shortchanging, and alternative rewards, legal, barter, and illegal moonlighting. Um, his point was that um, we need for in, in, in the hidden economies and for the functioning of society and the functioning of any single company when the salaries are not enough, I mean, there are some kind of resource that um, kind of um, help to um, protect the, the peace within the company. And when um, an employee knows that he's not being paid enough, he's going to look for rewards, legal rewards in the first place, or illegal rewards to compensate what he's not receiving from, in, in, from a, a formal reward. Um, look, at, look at this, um, this motto of, of Gerald Marsh. Go ahead, take that office pen. Stealing office pens, cheating on expenses, or letting the company pick up private bills is healthy and should be continued, says a Cambridge, England sociologist. In a study released Monday in London, Gerald Marsh says cheating increases job satisfaction, raises work production, and makes for a healthier economy. He divided cheating workers into four categories, wolves, vultures, hawks, and monkeys. Wolves, says Marsh, cheat, cheat, cheat in packs and are generally garbage collectors and dog workers. He goes on with all this description, but mm, the, the idea I wanted to, to, to stress is that he's trying to, to divide the psychology of groups of workers and how they manage the situations within their group and how they um, put boundaries in their own activities. It's not the same, for instance, the the individuality of a director that the um, gregarious com uh, the gregarious behavior of employees in the in the bottom of the company for example think about the um, informal control from one another in a, at, at the low level which is very usual i mean we we don't have to expect that the boss is uh, controlling me if we have all the time, I'm surrounded by colleagues at, at, the, at the workplace. That's very important to think about the concrete circumstances to avoid opportunities to corrupt activities. Um, map, mapping crime risk and understanding corruption. Um, well, what's, what's, I mean, we need to, and all the, the manuals, all the textbooks about uh, criminal compliance start by, start by this, this model, tone from the top. If we don't have good directors, I mean, all, all the, all the tasks in the company to build a, a good environment, a culture of, of compliance, it's very, really difficult, really difficult. So we need uh, good directors, and we know that this, I don't know if you, you have heard about this, this um, research that the psychological profile of a good director 
seems to be very close to a, a psychopath. <laughs> Have you heard about that? Because they are risk-seeking, because they are, they are bold, because they are um, happy or positive or optimistic. Okay, that's, that's fine with me. I mean, I like people like that. But, you know, uh, you can exaggerate a little bit these, these uh, features, personal features, and you can, you can find a psychopath. I'm a little bit exaggerated, but not, not so much. So um, when you have a, a very good director, you, the, 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 the same virtues could be the, the same uh, danger characteristics, personal characteristics. Um, I think I, I'm, I'm going to end. I have much more information, but all this stuff, um, probably um, Oscar Serrano has talked about all this, the um, corruption. We, you can, I'm ending with this thought. You can think on corruption in a different uh, level, at the different levels of analysis, and that's very important. You can think if you, for, for instance, if you individualize the corruption problem, you are talking about uh, one single corrupt person. That's a, a rotten apple in the barrel. I mean, uh, you can think on this person, if you know that this is the person, this is the case, and you can think in, in, on his concrete circumstances to avoid opportunities. But if you are thinking on a cultural corrupt environment in a company, in a society, that's much more difficult. The, the way of thinking of uh, routine activities and situational crime approach is it's easier to change environments than to change persons. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation. Uh, professor needs to leave uh, in about 10 minutes because he needs to be somewhere else, but I suppose you have time for maybe a couple of questions that might have raised. Uh... Well, maybe I start myself. Uh, with regards to the situational prevention you mentioned, uh, what will be the position of the whistleblower in this, in this design, I mean, to help this situational prevention? Does it have a role in to which extent should we protect him? And yeah, of course, because uh, uh, whistleblowers um, are called to be, uh, um, I mean, they are um, very good um, agents for natural surveillance. They are watching all the time and they are seeing what's going on around. So if they are not scared to talk about what's going on inside and they have the, the channels to, to tell um, the, the authorities or the person who is in charge what's going on, that's very easy. No? Um, the problem, I mean, is, at least in Spain, is um, if there is something that you don't know that, that the, um, the employee who is whistle the, the blowing the whistle is going to face after this, uh, his reporting. Probably the legislation is going to protect him. But you know that informally, He's going to be uh, somehow pressure, no? and I don't know what's what's going on in this field in Spain. Okay. So, any questions or whatever, critics or whatever. Okay. Well, then we uh, close now the. The session for today. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, hope to see you tonight, <laughs> and if not very soon, thank you. Okay.